I just go home now <laughs> after that, wow. <laughs> Actually, uh, June, that was in incredibly humbling to hear, hear such an introduction, and thank you for the invitation. It's always fun to come back, uh, and you will be hearing about some of the pieces of what she mentioned. Uh, I chose to ignore lung cancer tonight, not because it's the lesser of my two diseases that I work in, but just in interest of telling a story, it would be too confusing to go back and forth. So this is where I work, and without further ado, I will show you next, hopefully, the pretty slide my secretary made today. I said, just give me a timeline of my career. Now, I don't have to go over this because June just told you, but she went ahead and surprised me with the various logos and form this, but I, I do want to state one, one piece she forgot was this is where I started here as a conserve major, majoring in organ, and uh, won't say this uh, later, just to state now that when I graduated from Wheaton, and I still remain, I think, the only uh, chem major to play for baccalaureate, the organ um, prelude, so uh, I think I still hold that honor just here, it's one, one I'm very proud of. Uh, so then I switched, I came out of the conserve, switched to a chem major, did some student research with Neil Brace, then declared pre-med, went on to med school, residency, always taking some time to figure out what I'm going to do. It's a theme of my life, as you can tell, because I started out as an organ major. Uh, and now I've been my entire academic career at Loyola, uh, both doing my research, uh, which is pretty much national and international as well as local and seeing patients um, with a heavy load in breast and lung cancer. So this is me when I was a uh, fr uh, freshman, no, no, I was a, probably a sophomore, with Neil Brace and Harold Feast, two, my chem two of my mentors. And missing from the picture that you can't see, so really missing, is Larry Funk, <laughs> who at that time was a very popular uh, new assistant professor, had been there about a year, who taught me freshman chemistry and freshman chemistry being my only allowed elective in the conservatory back then. You got one elective as a freshman, and Elton Cronk, who some of you may remember, says, you want to take what? I said, chemistry, that's unheard of. Don't you want art or something? So anyway, thus, thus started my journey, and I'll come back to some of that at the very end. But I'm very proud of this slide, and unfortunately, uh, he was unable to come. He lives at, at Windsor now, uh, Dr. Neil Brace, uh, another who taught me a research method working along with other students in his lab uh, in many summers with many research grants, invaluable lessons in the scientific method that I've carried into my current research. And I proudly maintain my Journal of Organic Chemistry uh, manuscript citation on my uh, curriculum vitae uh, right at the top. I don't put it in chronology, I put it right at the top, although as you can see it took Neil uh, a number of years after our graduation from the early 70s to pull, the, pull out our notebooks and, and come up with this publication. So tell him I mentioned him tonight, except uh, I've never been Catherine, and I was, this is the only time I'm a Catherine. I'm a Kathy on my birth certificate, but I, I was just going to tease him tonight uh, if he was here, uh, but maybe don't tell him that. I don't think he knows this, and uh, better not tell him anymore. So what I'm going to talk about um, is uh, translational clinical research, and that's what I am. I, I, I walk between two worlds and between the bench and the bedside, not that I do bench research anymore, I don't. I talk to them, and we, in, we collaborate uh, from the bench to bedside and back. And this is the most efficient and effective cancer research uh, possible nowadays. And in fact, it's hard to get a grant funded if you're not doing this type of research. So you will see as I uh, talk about what I do, how this plays out. But just a few baseline definitions to start. What is clinical cancer research? And I apologize if I'm talking down to most of you, but uh, just so we're all on the same page. It's research that's directly involving or related to patients versus basic medical or biologic bench research. And there's pure clinical, for example, you're observing a group of patients and you come up with, hey, a light bulb goes off and you write it up, or it's translational where you're working back and forth with PhD scientists. <clears throat> it can be conducted uh, in advanced stage disease, 
in the adjuvant setting, and I'll describe that in a minute, or prevention. And it may also involve analyses of databases, a lot of interaction with biostatisticians, tumor banks connected with clinical trials, you'll hear about that tonight, that are patient outcome related. And then our trials are conducted in three phases, one, two, and three. The first phase involves out of animals into humans, investigational drugs, and usually is being done for safety in many cancer types in a given study. So these are patients who've exhausted all their options with standard treatment and they go to a phase one study. I won't be discussing that tonight. Phase two then tests the best dose and schedule out of phase one, and then you want to focus it on a specific tumor type. And then phase three, large comparison <coughs> studies, compare the something new, which you're hoping is gonna be better, to the standard of care for that particular stage of disease. Cl uh, cancer clinical trials are responsible for the majority of our advances in the treatment of cancer. They're conducted by National Cancer Institute sponsored cooperative groups by academic cancer centers or by other consortia and can be industry-led and or grant-based. And these are available to patients either at academic cancer centers or in many community oncology sites. Now, I will not be talking about advanced breast cancer even tonight. I'll be talking about early stage breast cancer, curative intent settings. And here we talk about adjuvant studies and what this means is being done in addition to the definitive surgery where definitive surgery, getting rid of the cancer, is primary, but these are other therapies that go through the body systemically to, to kill any micrometastases or any small cells undetectable by our modern methods of imaging uh, that could then show up as a metastasis. So a woman does not die, for example, of the breast cancer in the breast, she will die perhaps several years later when it recurs in the liver, lung, bone. So our adjuvant treatment is meant to kill those cells before they grow up to be an overt metastasis when they're no longer curable. So to kill them before they develop drug resistance. And in these types of studies, as you'll hear me talking about, we discuss uh, a couple outcome endpoints, disease-free survival, which is survival without any recurrence, and then overall survival. Because in breast cancer, happily, even if it, the cancer recurs somewhere in the body, you can still control it for a long time with various treatments. So the overall survival can be longer than the disease-free survival. So these types of studies then are designed to increase cure rates and long follow-up is needed in breast cancer. Five years is a milestone, but it's not the milestone because breast cancer can recur many, many years later. As a result of all of our clinical trials, up to when I entered my career in breast cancer research, uh, we have seen a decline in the mortality of breast cancer. And this is an older slide, but suffice it to say that these lines are still coming down in the, in the next decade. And this improvement, which is seen in the United States, the UK, and now many other Western countries are starting to have the same statistic, have to do with early application of adjuvant therapy from our first clinical trials that were something versus nothing. We had to prove the giving treatments. And when I first came out of my training, those were the types of trials that were being done. But now because those have been applied around here, we're seeing their impact in mortality. So I will take you where I started, and we're gonna start where I started in my career after I got out of my fellowship. And I'm gonna weave a tale for you about a national clinical trial that I was honored to chair and to design and is a trial that still keeps on giving, as you'll see, so to speak. We're still learning from these women that were enrolled on this trial. So to start the tale, I'll take you back to the late 80s when I was a lowly assistant professor and was getting involved in our national clinical trials group. And I was charged with designing a phase three study in postmenopausal women to build on the observations of the outcomes that we had been seeing in younger women. We accrued patients throughout North America over a decade and demonstrated for the first time improved survival in these older women by safely adding anthracycline-containing chemotherapy, which was really 
a boon to the treatment of younger women, but we had been afraid to apply it in older women because it can be cardiotoxic to the, toxic to the heart. So we demonstrated this, and I will now take you through the story. So first of all, the rationale for it is that adjuvant, again, systemic therapy goes throughout the body after breast surgery, adjuvant chemotherapy and tamoxifen were proven value in early stage breast cancer, but the efficacy of combining the two modalities, so tamoxifen is an anti-estrogen pill, chemotherapy is toxic drugs. Uh, so the efficacy of combining these in postmenopausal women whose tumors had the estrogen receptor expressed on their tumors was uncertain, and we knew there was a strong benefit in, w in younger women. So I have these two slides of the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group, and this is a group which I'm honored to be a member of the steering committee, which involves breast cancer trialists from around the world. Every country that has done breast cancer clinical trials in the early stage curative setting. And we meet in Oxford, uh, stay on the university campus every five years, and update the database. And so what you're seeing here, first of all, looking at the top two panels, is in tumors that do not have the estrogen receptor expressed, long-term follow-up of our clinical trials of a three-drug combination versus no chemotherapy at all. So this was long-term follow-up of the something versus nothing types of studies. And here you see with re increasing rates of recurrence on the vertical axis, horizontal, increasing time of follow-up, you can see how widely separated uh, these two curves are, uh, showing the benefit uh, of adding something uh, to nothing. And then for anthracyclines, those drugs that can damage the heart, again, compared to nothing, another major benefit. But look what happens over here. Same studies, but this time tamoxifen's being given as the standard because the tumors express the estrogen receptor. So you're giving an anti-estrogen pill to link up with the receptor and stunt the growth of tumors. In this setting, chemotherapy is not adding much. It's adding some, it's statistically significant. These are thousands of patients. Uh, anthracycline's the same. Adding to this story is an age interaction. And as you can see here, if you look at combination chemotherapy, plus tamoxifen versus tamoxifen alone. In younger women, the benefit, older, not so old, I say, but 50 to 69 age group, uh, a benefit, but much less. So in the trial that I was charged to design, what we wanted to do then is take these anthracyclines that were really working in younger women. I should say that in these trials, we're not anthracycline containing for the, for the most part. Uh, those drugs were avoided in older women. So take these drugs, the three drug regimens, cyclophosphamide, an alkylating agent, doxorubicin, the anthracycline, and 5-fluorouracil, a combination that's commonly used, to see if it's superior to tamoxifen alone. This study had a second objective, uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. But this was the study it had, as we call them, arms, randomized by computer for postmenopausal women with positive lymph nodes, and again, all of them had estrogen receptors measured on their tumors. The control arm is here, because as I said before, giving postmenopausal women tamoxifen was the gold standard. And then there were two arms with the chemotherapy and tamoxifen, here concurrently and here sequentially. So our first analysis, the study was designed statistically up front to compare the combination of these two arms to this, and this is what we saw. Remember, um, I started this study writing it up in the late 80s. Look when I published it in Lancet in 2009. So not only did the study take a decade to accrue its participants, but then we had to follow them long enough to see what's happened. So you can't report these studies at year two, year five. It took a long time to make sure this uh, survival curve was robustly separated. These are very few events way out here, so this is unstable at this part. But basically, you can see um, a, a definite statistical significance. In our business, anything less than 0.05 is considered a positive result. So this was robustly significant. And this is for that endpoint, free of recurrence or death. The other endpoint I told you was overall survival, and here you see that. Very interesting, Look what this is, it took a long time to see this impact 
translate into overall survival, but it was also significant. Now, as I showed you in that schema, this trial had a translational research component. And that was because we co uh, collaborated with scientists that were working in cell lines, and I'll show you that in a minute, where there was observed to be an antagonism between combining chemotherapy and tamoxifen. And because of the question that we were prospectively asking and its result, we changed the standard of care worldwide in how to uh, time endocrine therapy, such as tamoxifen and chemotherapy. So this is the second objective then, to assess if the chemotherapy fo uh, followed by tamoxifen would be superior to concurrent therapy. Now there's a lot of laboratory evidence, as I said, so we, we had to get into that literature and look at what was being observed by the scientists predominantly writing in the 80s on this topic. And on here you can see that tamoxifen, an an this anti-estrogen tablet, induces accumulation of a breast cancer cell line at G0, G1 in the cell cycle. Uh, it had an anti-proliferative effect preventing, present, preventing kill by S phase specific chemotherapy drugs because the these uh, cells to have chemotherapy benefit need to be actively dividing, whereas here they're stuck in G0, G1. And also cell line work that tamoxifen is antagonistic with 5-fluorouracil and melcholan, an alkylator, variable data with anthracyclines and cyclophosphamide, and also tamoxifen alters hepatic enzyme metabolism of chemotherapy agents. So here's what we saw. It now, be the same trial, but here it's split by the three arms rather than lumping the two chemotherapy arms together. On the bottom is tamoxifen by itself, in the middle is the concurrent therapy, and on the top is the sequential therapy. And the difference here is a whopping 12% absolute difference. You know, yes, we'd like to see <coughs> these curves up here, but without tamoxifen or any treatment, this curve would be down here. So a lot of our research has been this stepwise progress. And here's the overall survival, um, also showing that split later with the sequential therapy emerging on top. So the practice implications for this research um, are that concurrent chemotherapy plus tamoxifen could result in a suboptimal benefit from certain chemotherapy programs potentially reducing their efficacy by 50%. And these results generated a new practice standard worldwide, so we now start adjuvant tamoxifen after your chemotherapy is completed. Well, let's go on. There's more from this uh, trial, obviously. So what we next did was reported provocative results on a multi-gene analysis of the tumors from a subset of women enrolled on this trial I've just been talking about who had donated their tumors to a specimen bank. These were donated in the 80s and 90s when the trial was accruing, and now in the late 2000s, uh, we have been able to come up with some valuable information based on new technology in analyzing tumors, small specimens uh, for multiple genes. And this uh, work that I'm about to show you tested the possibility of avoiding chemotherapy despite having involved lymph nodes. Remember um, my trial, not my trial, but I'll say my trial here. Our trial, a lot of collaborators, um, uh, involved only women with positive lymph nodes under their axilla that had spread from the breast. So these are a more advanced group. And the default now, back, you know, fast forwarding into the late 90s is to treat all of these women with adjuvant chemotherapy and then tamoxifen. So, this is looking at can you avoid chemotherapy in a group that you've already proven chemotherapy is good for. Make sure you catch this because this is critical to the uh, shift in paradigm that these results are now suggesting. So this is the topic now. Adjuvant chemotherapy, who should be spared? Well, if you know someone who's had breast cancer and have read a pathology report, or maybe a breast cancer survivor here in the audience, you know. It's, the path of reports are, are uniform in giving uh, size, lymph nodes, uh, and if it's small, negative lymph nodes, the estrogen receptors are very high, the tumor is of low pathologic grade, has a low proliferative rate measured by KI67, and the HER2 gene is not amplified. 
This is a group where we might consider um, sparing chemotherapy to receive endocrine therapy alone or no treatment. We do have an online tool that we use regularly each week in the clinic. We sit our patients down and show them this because you can get some idea about what the benefit of therapy would be for a group of women like the one in front of you. So this particular patient, age 60, minor health problems, tumor estrogen receptor positive, tumor grade two, this size range, no positive lymph nodes. And here you can quote that if she has no additional therapy, even though these are relatively good features, she still has about a 25% of re relapsing in red. If you give her a pill like tamoxifen or the newer generation aromatase inhibitors, you buy the yellow out of the red, so that's the benefit you get from that. If you just chose to give chemotherapy alone, which you would not do because of this estrogen receptor, you don't get much, and when you combine, you get a little bit more than, than, than hormonal therapy alone. But this is, this is rough, and what we know now from um, <clears throat> microarray work, the intrinsic subtypes of breast cancer are many. This slide is even out of date now, but I just wanted to point out, just for the subtypes that are estrogen receptor positive, in the green and in this uh, purpley color here, mer burgundy maybe, uh, luminal A and luminal B, you see the vast difference in outcomes. So this is probability of survival over time. If you give chemotherapy before surgery, which we often do, I said adjuvant can be before or after. A lot of times if the tumor is bigger, you can shrink it before the breast surgery. Look at this luminal A. The percentage of complete disappearance of tumor by the time of surgery is zero uh, for this biology, this indolent biology, even though it's strongly estrogen receptor positive whereas the other estrogen re receptor positive subtype has a 20% chance of a complete remission. And these other subtypes, especially this triple negative, which you hear about a lot, 73%. So marked heterogeneity. And the Europeans actually were onto this before even these multi-gene arrays were done, and they just looked at a simple question here of estrogen receptor level. And this is uh, a clinical trial conducted uh, in Europe of a first generation combination chemotherapy regimen plus tamoxifen versus tamoxifen alone. And overall the trial was positive for the combination, but look what happens here where the chemotherapy benefit is occurring in the lower levels of estrogen receptor positivity. Once you start giving out here to the higher levels, nothing's happening. So this, is a rel this was a new paradigm about you know, a decade ago starting to come, come out and what we are learning then, rather than what we had been taught and what these um, online tools do, is you don't have the same degree of benefit across biology. No matter the risk level, they do not all benefit to the same. So here, if you can't measure estrogen and progesterone receptors on the tumor, chemotherapy is your only option and it actually works quite well in getting cures. Out here, if both receptors are high and none of these other adverse features, chemo doesn't work, and in the middle, you have uncertainty. And certainly in the clinic from week to week, I rarely see a patient who has all of these things good. And I could say, yes, even though your lymph nodes are positive, I think you could avoid chemotherapy. And that's because of this mix of subtypes. Again, repeating a little, a little bit different way what I said a few minutes ago. Chemotherapy sensitivity is variable in the group of patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. It comes from a major benefit to no benefit despite the same level of risk of recurrence. The relative efficacy of regimen seems to be driven by the degree of endocrine responsiveness and various multi-gene classifiers that are based on proliferation genes, the intrinsic subtypes, that luminal AB that I showed you earlier, or other modules. And this subtype heterogeneity most likely explains the controversy across trials of chemotherapy efficacy and differential benefit by age of patient. So a few years ago, breast cancer experts worldwide were polled for their top 10 reasons, top, top 10, the most important translational breast cancer research questions that our funding bodies, the NIH, others should use to score grants. And the top vote getter 
was this one, identification of molecular signatures to select patients on adjuvant endocrine therapy, like tamoxifen, who could be spared chemotherapy. So let's look at some of this evidence. There are a number of classifiers now that look at multiple gene expression in a breast cancer, not just single genes that you can get off a pathology report. Estrogen receptor is a gene, of course, a gene expression. But we have several of these, and uh, they're all marketed, and they all have describe a low-risk group. And this low-risk group, although the genes are not the same that are coming up to be low-risk, Regardless, the classifier will find a low-risk group driven by low expression of proliferation genes. With relative sensitivity to the tamoxifen or the aromatase inhibitors and relative chemotherapy resistance. Only the Oncotype DX, which is a 21 gene recurrent score assay, has been tested in these phase three clinical trials. First in node negative disease, which I'll show you, and then what we did in node positive disease. So this is the classifier, the 21 gene recurrence score assay, marketed as Oncotype DX. Uh, it predicts distant relapse at 10 years, assuming the patient takes five years of tamoxifen and the lymph nodes are negative. This is where it was first developed, New England Journal of Medicine publication. And these are the 16 genes and five reference genes, and these were pulled, from, pulled specimens from, five, from three clinical trials. Uh, there's a proliferation access with five genes, the estrogen invasion, HER2, three other genes, and then the reference genes. And this recurrence score is here. You don't have to calculate it. For $3,000, you get the score done. And actually, they don't like to tell you some of these genes. We're trying to get them to. But they will report, this is RT-PCR-based uh, uh, assays off of paraffin blocks. So it's very easy to send to the laboratory to do. And then. There's a categorization that you also get with recurrent scores less than 18 being low, intermediate, and high. And this is the kind of report that comes back, and when it comes back for your patient, um, her score is down here, the range is 0 to 50, and then the rate of distant recurrence over 10 years. Again, it assumes the patient takes five years of tamoxifen because these are ER positive, estrogen receptor positive. <coughs> so down here, in the lower recurrence scores, it's prognostic. There's less likelihood of recurrence. It's predictive of a greater benefit to tamoxifen, but no to minimal chemotherapy benefit. And then the flip side over here for the higher scores. And this depicts it in a different way. This is now a validation study done on a different clinical trial conducted by the NSABP. Uh, and this was a trial in node negative breast cancer of tamoxifen versus chemo plus tamoxifen, which was a positive trial overall. But look at this. This is not every patient benefits the same. This is a major paradigm shift in how we've been thinking about our treatments. Down here in these low scores, there's the yellow is chemo, uh, the yellow is tamoxifen alone, excuse me, and this is chemo. These, these are very close together. You wouldn't give a patient these drugs uh, just for this little bit of difference, but out here, in these high scores, there is a major benefit. So uh, our guidelines groups, the national uh, NCCN group is one. I'm not going to read through this, but in, under the pink dots, the guideline basically says to order this assay in lymph node negative breast cancer. Uh, but here in green, for lymph node positive, it's recommending both endocrine therapy and adjuvant chemotherapy. And the new data I'm about to show you from this trial that keeps on giving challenges this chemotherapy for all standard in lymph node positive disease. It has predictive value for who benefits from that CAF chemo that I showed you earlier and who does not, even when the risk level is higher based on involved lymph nodes under the arm. And this just reminding you was the study I show, I've showed you already. Again, this was the group, chemotherapy followed by tamoxifen that was superior overall, had that 12% absolute benefit over tamoxifen alone. Now, um, in the era when we conducted the study, it was not mandatory that patients submitted, agreed to submit part of their tumor to the National Specimen Bank. It was optional then. So 
That's why our data are considered provocative but not definitive because as you, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but the sample at the bottom where we had um, the final sample where we could look at the best arm versus the control arm was 367 when the whole study was 1477. Now happily, the characteristics of this um, biomarker sample were very similar to the parent trial and we went through a lot of statistical justification for this when we did this uh, analysis. Uh, RT-PCR sometimes cannot be obtained well from a paraffin block, especially if the blocks are quite old and you can see here there were different reasons uh, in 9% uh, of the patients. So this is the uh, take home slide from what we saw. Up here, the low risk recurrence score is less than 18, no benefit, and if anything, tamoxifen is hovering uh, better than the chemotherapy tamoxifen group. And then down here in the high risk scores is where we saw the benefit. Now the problem here is both of these, while the there's no benefit, there's about a 60% 10-year risk of an event. So the event could be a recurrence, it could be death from other causes. So because this study was done in postmenopausal women when they were enrolled, and as you saw, we followed them for 12 or 14 years, the, the theory was perhaps this is low because they were dying of other causes not related to breast cancer. So we then went back and conducted a, a, a second analysis and these results have just been published this year in Lancet Oncology. And here you see in the low group, uh, very excellent 10-year uh, breast cancer specific survival with no benefit from chemotherapy. And the benefit is occurring in these high recurrence score patients. So as June mentioned, um, I was really surprised just two weeks ago to um, see this work cited uh, in Nature Review's uh, clinical oncology as one of the key breast cancer advances of 2010. And this is quoting from Drs. Higgins and Basalga, the notion that all patients with higher risk of relapse, that is positive lymph nodes, cancer escaping the breast already, uh, benefit equally from chemotherapy does not make biological sense and may simply be untrue. While these findings will have to be confirmed in a prospective fashion, it is time for us to consider that not all high-risk patients will benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy, and there is a need to develop efficacious therapies in chemotherapy refractory, non-HER2 responsive, but estrogen receptor positive high-risk disease. And we'll come back to something I'm working on at the very end uh, along these lines. But to this, I will add, we must move to rapidly test adding other agents targeted to crosstalk pathways that talk to the estrogen receptor pathway for this type of biology, rather than persisting to give these women toxic chemotherapy drugs when they're just not working. So uh, last month, SWAG 1007, which is the daughter of my trial, so it's taken all this time to birth a new study. It was launched by and the National Cancer Institute. We have a very smart um, assistant professor from MD Anderson as the PI. I think they figured it put me in the grave to do another one, but I'm happy to uh, collaborate as a co-investigator with her. Uh, and basically what this study will do is validate our findings. And I'm not gonna take you through the nuances of the schema, but uh, what it is doing in 8,800 patients uh, is finding those with a recurrence score less than or equal to 25, which has seemed to be where the cut point was in my analysis of no benefit to chemotherapy. And they're gonna be randomized prospectively to get chemotherapy or not. So it's gonna take another 10 or 15 years to have the answer to this. And in the meantime, there are camps all over the country, some believing in the biology that it's the same as we saw in node negative, let's start avoiding chemo, and others, purists, wanting to see this trial finished. Okay, so let's go on. The trial that keeps on giving is, has uh, also, in parallel with the maturing of the overall survival, was added to um, other trials in our clinical trial database and provided new insights in racial disparities in cancer survival. <coughs> so the outcome of patients 
of African ancestry with cancer is a subject of heated debates. Population cancer mortality rates, as I'm sure you know, vary substantially by race and are usually higher for African Americans, especially in prostate and breast cancers. The differences have been explained, and there are valid reasons for this explanation, by disparities in socioeconomic status, access to care, baseline disease characteristics, for example, more advanced stage at presentation, at diagnosis, and tumor biology. But in clinical trial settings, there's starting to be a recurring theme that um, worse survival still occurred, uh, especially in African Americans, when you adjusted for stage of disease. And when you looked at trials that treated all the patients the same by the same doctors, very homogeneous, removing the access to care barrier is the reason, you still saw this disparity. So what we did was conducted a series of analyses on our phase three trials across disease types to address this issue and then followed by an in-depth study of breast cancer trials. So this was our database. A lot of collaborations here with the biostatisticians. It was translational in that respect. Uh, but over almost 20,000 patients on the various trials for these, and of which 12% uh, were African American, a rate commensurate with the diagnoses of these diseases in the general population. And this is the take-home slide. In all the cancers on this list, there was no difference by race except these, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and prostate cancer. And it's interesting, uh, these organs, um, hormonally uh, dependent, that's, that's a clue for where we need to go next with this. But as you can see here, when we adjusted for um, uh, prognostic factors for premenopausal breast cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and advanced prostate, there's a highly significant difference. These hazard ratios basically mean 41% worse outcome for African Americans, 49%, 61% worse, 21% <coughs> worse, all significant. And this uh, sorts it out then, uh, looking now at the breast cancer specific trials by pre and postmenopausal for disease free survival, overall survival, and breast cancer specific mortality about a 40% to 50% worse outcome, uh, highly significant for African Americans. <clears throat> we published this work um, in 2009 in the Journal of National Cancer Institute. And I, I don't have time to show you all the analyses, but we adjusted for, for the treatment, delivered for tumor factors, uh, body mass index, socioeconomic status, using education and income levels based on zip code, <coughs> Um, it was true in the pure ER negative trials and in our ER positive trials. So the theory that because African Americans have more of this triple negative, estrogen and progesterone receptor negative and HER2 negative breast cancer, a more aggressive biology, that maybe that's why blacks do worse, but we saw the same in our estrogen receptor positive cohorts. So as June mentioned, the report to the nation from the Maine Society for uh, Cancer Medicine uh, last year described this work as a notable, notable advance uh, in cancer disparities and groundbreaking. And so I thought, well, you know, well and good, but where do we go from here with this descriptive work? How can we explain these observations? And then eventually the goal would be to impact on treatment approaches. So what we did, went back to you know who again, and tried to see if we could glean any additional information from that 21 gene analysis work that we did and looking at it by race to see if we could uh, hone down on the different genes that were expressed and did they differentially express in uh, blacks versus whites. So uh, we presented this work um, in June at the annual meeting and uh, I've already talked to you about the parent trial and about the recurrence core subset but now if you look within that, you have 139 African Americans overall and the ones that donated their tumor to the bank, you're down to a whopping 27. So this is why this is considered provocative and, and you know, hypothesis generating work, but certainly not yet definitive. But regardless, when we looked at the overall recurrence score, we saw no difference between African Americans and others. The estrogen receptor axis, which had four genes in it out of these 21, the HER2 axis, 
the invasion axis, and other genes, no difference. But every single gene in the proliferation axis, these are the genes in this assay, had higher expression in African Americans. And this is the plot showing the difference overall for the proliferation axis uh, and for each of these <coughs> individual genes, again, all significant. <coughs> We then went and adjusted for different things uh, in our Cox models, multivariate analyses, and you could adjust, 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 adjust. When you got done adjusting, you still had a 23% worse outcome for African Americans. So this doesn't explain everything. It explains a bulk of it, but there's still something left that we don't know. So what we found then is that tumors in African Americans have higher proliferation and thus a more aggressive behavior. We are unable to fully explain this disparity after all the adjustments, so there are probably additional pathways or host factors that impact on this biology. And the mechanisms that create this biology are unclear, but once learned will inform our treatment choice. So we're moving forward, and we're, going to, we're putting together right now an R01 application to explore an out-of-Africa hypothesis for this and look at multiple aspects. And these are just a few background slides for what we're going to try and do. Migration over the millennia has resulted in numerous differences between populations from different continents, as you well know. For example, darker pigmentation, the ancestral skin color, changes to lighter with migration to northern regions has implications for vitamin D synthesis and more aggressive cancers, potentially. Adaptation to endemic infectious disease a robust immune inflammatory responses are useful for their origi original purpose, but are possibly carcinogenic and or result in more aggressive cancers. Additional traits selected for in native African environment in the forced diaspora to North America, such as hormone levels, body fat deposition, food storage and dietary habits, for example, Genotypes inherited from your parents selected for adequate energy depots for periods of drought and starvation actually result in higher weights in North America, less activity, and greater energy intake. There are higher concentrations of estrogens and androgens with differences in estrogen receptor alpha and beta and the androgen receptor, and also complex interactions and crosstalk with the insulin pathway and other growth factors. So how can we better understand predictors of the more aggressive proliferative tumors in African Americans? Well, to date, there's only been small studies, no prospective study to explore the potential causes, and the data I just showed you are provocative. But following our presentation in June, the National Cancer Institute came to us, a very rare event, and said, would you be willing to submit a grant to study this further? So that's a hint that they might be willing to fund this, which is a nice thing to hear. So we are working on it, and our proposal is to determine if all these factors that I very quickly just rushed through with you play a role in differential tumor biology and survival by ancestry. So the inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, estrogen, androgen, insulin, and growth factors, vitamin D level, genotypes for body fat storage and energy balance, and plant versus meat-based diet. We will measure and correlate these with breast and prostate cancer specific standard factors and molecular based tumor profiles such as the assay I've talked about uh, and other multi-gene assays and correlate with survival. So wish us luck. Uh, we're going to hopefully get this put together and submitted this year. Well, the last part now of my presentation on merging bench to bedside through translational clinical research is where are we headed as a field in 2011? First, I'm going to show you novel trial uh, an example of novel clinical trial designs to more efficiently and effectively bring new classes of drugs to the bedside, and it's the iSpy2 trial. So we'll go to that first. iSpy2, uh, funded by the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, with upfront stakeholders buying into this design of the FDA, uh, industry, the NIH and uh, cancer centers. So this is our current model of drug discovery. Uh, and bottom line here without taking you through all the steps. You get a hint from what I just showed you, don't you? I started out as an assistant professor with my trial, and now as a tenured full professor, I'm publishing the results. 
So it takes 10 to 15 years uh, by the old way of doing these in the adjuvant setting with several thousand patients and following them for a long time. Lots of volunteers and about $1 billion to take one FDA approved drug from the start to the finish. So why ISPY2? Well, these inefficient clinical trials, although they've resulted in major advances, they account for the majority of the time and cost associated with the failures of our current system. So what ISPY2 proposes to do is increase the number of agents and targets tested within one clinical trial, reduce the time to conclusive results using neoadjuvant treatment, and is your primary endpoint, not this long overall survival, but that pathologic complete disappearance of tumor in the breast. So move all of your treatments up front. Uh, concurrent development of predictive biomarkers for each agent will be increased and will reduce the number of patients and volunteers required through a novel statistical method called adaptive randomization. And this is a summary of the study plan, which is uh, too detailed to go into in depth. But basically, at, up front, the patients are screened uh, with, and they have a breast MRI, mammogram, biopsy. Uh, Multi-gene assays are done on the tumor in real time in order to then put the patient into the randomization so that based on her biology, uh, she will be assigned to the appropriate investigational agent, which is always going to be given together with one of our standard drugs, paclitaxel, but uh, the agents will vary and will be ba vary based on the biology and will vary based on how they're performing in real time. So this is the adaptive process. Then the investigational agent stops and they go on and get the rest of their standard treatment. So there's always a control arm up here which is very standard, state-of-the-art, uh, neoadjuvant upfront therapy. Here they have their definitive breast cancer uh, surgery. Uh, so let's see, uh, as this is going on, a predictive index is built statistically for each therapy and the biomarker combination together. And the patients are adaptively randomized, so at the beginning, the randomization is balanced, but if a drug is performing well, the computer will then bring more patients into the active therapy. It's, it's, it's a totally new paradigm for doing these trials. So as you can envision, we can evaluate many drugs and combinations. The success will then go straight into a phase three, where you will only enroll patients with the right biology. So see, we had to go through all these years to find the right biology. Now we'll be able to do it up front, and then hopefully you'll be able to pick the winners much more quickly. And then, flip side, underperformers will be dropped early for futility. And so um, Loyola is honored to be one of the 20-some uh, cancer centers uh, that were invited to be part of this. Uh, it's chaired by UCSF. Uh, and these are, I'm not going to go into them, but these are just the agents that are the first kids on the block to go into the trial. And I'm uh, also uh, privileged to be an agent chaperone, they're calling us which means uh, right now we're in the midst of negotiating with the FDA the language for the <coughs> side effect monitoring for this angiogenesis inhibitor before it pops into the trial. So it's very exciting. Now, in addition to doing work like this, we have to get even better. We have to attack the hubs, not single networks, and we have to recognize most cancers are smart versus the few stupid ones around. So let me develop that a little bit. This is taking us beyond single kinase pathways into networks, which will be the key to increasing cures. So networks in our cancer cells have a few hubs, but all these other nodes are only weakly connected, and most of our therapies tend to be targeted out here. So if you get rid of some of this, this just takes over, and that's what I meant by you have to attack the crosstalk uh, earlier. Biological organisms are unaffected most by most random mutations, but mutations affecting any of the hubs will be lethal. So the cancer lesson, of course, is to find ways to target key hubs. <clears throat> Human cancers are segmenting based on the number of mutation-based drivers. So we have a few stupid cancers, chronic myelogenous leukemia or GIST tumors, a rare stomach type, uh, stomach malignancy for the most part, where you can just knock out one kinase pathway and you can cure the patient with a pill. However, most of our common cancers are smart, 
they have many drivers. So a mu the mutational load determines whether one has a smart or a stupid cancer. And it gets worse. So assume most cancers are smart and have multiple activated kinase pathways or drivers, and targeting them all then would increase benefit. That's where our pharmaceutical industries are now. They all have pipelines with multiple targets to these different pathways, and they are wanting us to design trials with multiple targeted agents. All the companies want trials for the same smaller set of patients. So now imagine cancers with just simple, it's not this simple, but just with two drivers. What is the number of patients you need to study up front to look at their biology to see if they would qualify for the trial? This is the number needed to study analysis that George Sledge, our society president, uh, proposed uh, recently in, in his address. So this is one kinase. This is a real example. Number needed to study is one divided by the percentage of patients who have the biomarker positive on their cancer times the assay's accuracy times the fraction of those patients that have this much that are actually eligible for the trial. Maybe they have heart disease or something they can't go on. And then times the fraction giving informed consent to participate, which isn't 100% of who you present. So this is a real example. HER2 positive breast cancer, we have not talked about that, has a target, uh, trastuzumab. And uh, if you multiply all these fractions out, you need to look, for, look at 14 patients to find one with HER2 positive breast cancer. So that's reasonable. If you just go up to two, this is what you get. You need to look for, through 154 patients to find one patient. And that's doing a lot of work, so it's not possible. So we have to look probably with less emphasis on targeting single kinase pathways, look to the hubs. We have to do other things in parallel, and we are. A whole nother story is emerging, targeting DNA replication and DNA damage repair with PARP inhibitors, a very exciting story this past year. We also need to focus more on lifestyle modifications and metabolomic interventions. Not much is known about how to harness the immune system in solid tumors like breast cancer or to how to interfere with the tumor's microenvironment. To invoke metastasis suppressor gene products is a new field. And then lastly, I'll say just a word about this, attacking the cancer stem cell. This cancer stem cell usually survives after our standard therapies. That's why we give these adjuvant therapies and the women live many <coughs> years, but gosh, then there's year eight, the liver metastasis shows up. So that cancer stem cell has hung around and has slowly rubbed up and developed uh, progeny over time to create a metastasis. So we've been doing um, some preliminary work looking at the notch inhibitor MK0752 and endocrine therapy like tamoxifen in early stage breast cancer in another novel trial design called the pre-surgical window, and I'm just going to show you a bit of this. Targeting critical cancer cell survival pathways to overcome resistance. Breast tumor initiating cells, that's a new lingo, till TICs, we used to say breast cancer stem cells, but because of the stem cell controversy, people get confused about what kind of stem cells you're talking about. So here we're talking about stem cells in the tumor use notch receptors and notch ligands with other pathways for their self-renewal, which results then in tumor proliferation and progression. Basic scientists, PhDs at, at our institution, showed that notch inhibition with novel compounds, gamma secretase inhibitors, close to going on the market in um, Parkinson's disease, by the way, excuse me, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, uh, but that's where the work was first done with this class of drugs. Uh, the, they potentiate the effects of tamoxifen in mouse xenograft models. And uh, our group published this in Cancer Research in 2008. But it was unknown whether bringing these gamma secretase inhibitors together with tamoxifen in a patient would result in modulation of notch and other proliferation markers. So that's where it comes <coughs> in this new con trial concept. It's not a treatment study. You're not giving the drugs for a long time. You're using it just in that window between diagnosis of the breast cancer and when you're going to take the tumor out. So the patient is the mouse, so to speak. <laughs> and you're, you're doing that uh, experiment right before the definitive surgery. And this is our design. 
We work together with Merck. Merck has um, probably the best gamma secretase inhibitor out there right now. It's not on the market, of course. But here on the first day after the patient has their diagnostic biopsy and then takes tamoxifen or the aromatase inhibitor pill for 14 days. And so then we do another biopsy just to have a baseline of what the change is between no treatment and here. And then we add this drug for just a week. Three days on, four days off, three days on. Keep the tamoxifen electrozole going and the patient goes on to have her surgery. So the whole thing takes 25 days. Requires patient buy-in to say, okay, I'm not gonna have my breast sur cancer surgery next week. I'm gonna let you do this and wait the 25 days. So that's a challenge. And for this, we give the patient $500 because she's getting an extra biopsy here. She doesn't need for her care. It's being strictly done to look at biomarkers. And we have um, almost reached our 20 patients uh, in the last two years. So it's, it's a harder model to work with, but it's, it's being done to look at what happens, to see if what we saw in the mouse and what was going on in the stem cell is actually happening in patients. So taking you through a long story and just to the summary, despite very short exposure of this compound, only a week, at a dose, by the way, significantly lower than in the phase one trials in advanced cancers where it's being tested, all tumors showed significant biomarker response. And these responses were strong molecular indications of <coughs> anti-proliferative or pro-apoptotic, pro-cell death responses to this agent. So KI-67, our proliferation marker decreased in eight out of 10. Uh, NOXA, a pro-apoptotic uh, protein increased, good thing, in seven out of 10. Either of them happened in 10 out of 10. NOTCH-4, which plays a key role in the breast cancer stem cells, was the most consistent marker of inhibition, decreasing in eight out of 10, and NOTCH-1 in six out of 10, I will say, We've gone on and submitted the next group of patients uh, for our annual meeting, and the results are even more dramatic with five additional patients to these. And this just shows you patient by patient, the first group, notch for mRNA expression, uh, decreasing here significantly in the majority of patients. So our working hypothesis is here. <clears throat> When you give this gamma secretase inhibitor, it inhibits this pathway, which leads to proliferation, and inhibits the inhibition of NOTCH1 on the proapoptotic portion. So turning off uh, an inhibitor leads to cell death. So concluding now on a personal and spiritual note. I've left out mention of oncopolitics. It is a word we use, and difficult challenges I've had along the way. Contracted funding occurs in all disciplines of science, of course, levels of funding, fierce competition for the best new drug at your center, and for the patients to come to your center. Increased demands on your time while you're trying to do all this research with the patient load that you have from day to day and taking care of the patients and their families. So I humbly and gratefully view the successes and the recent accolades and citations that I've been surprised with this year about my research as the Lord's encouragement and affirmation of what I do. Preparing this talk led me to reread my 2001 Wheaton College Chapel address, and I'm depressed it has taken off the archive now. You can no longer go and read it. It disappeared, <laughs> replaced by Hudson Arbiting, 1970, and others. So a valid replacement, but anyway, I spoke on Hebrews 13, 20, 21, which was the year verse that year, that God does indeed equip you with everything good for doing his will. And also one of my professors at Wheaton loved, Bible profs, loved to use the word, God is our superintendent of our life. And I've carried that theme with me throughout my career. And it's true for any of our career paths, that he directs us in ways we often do not understand or even realize step by step in the fullness of his grace. Because in 1970, I was a pipe organ major. So thank you very much for your attention. And I still love the pipe organ. Do I play it much?
Questions? Yes, during the question and answer uh, time, if you would wait uh, until the microphone is brought to you to make sure that we get it on the recording. We appreciate it. You can raise your hand, then we'll know where to take the microphone. I also, at one point, during my freshman year wanted to go to seminary, so I was really mixed up that year. <laughs> and my chem profs did come and listen to me practice. I'd sometimes find them sitting in Edmond when I was practicing. It was nice. Question? Oh, I'm sorry. What are the criteria for determining if you should do that $3,000 genetics test? Okay. Um, it requires a, a, a careful discussion with the patient, but in general, again, these are women whose cancer is not spread to other parts of their body, number one. Number two, the tumor has the estrogen receptor measured on it. Number three, the patient would be willing to get chemotherapy potentially based on the result. There are those patients who say, no matter what, I will never take chemotherapy. There's no sense in doing the test. <coughs> the test, by the way, is covered by insurance. So uh, the days when it was first developed, we had to go through, jump through a lot of hoops to get insurance to pay for it, but Medicare covers it now. So it's much easier than it was um, uh, eight years ago when it was first there. Now, in terms of with positive lymph nodes, Negative lymph nodes, it's, it's, it's easier to justify. Positive, again, as I said, the default is still, because there are many positive lymph nodes, to give chemotherapy. Our new prospective trial will answer the question in 15 years. So I will discuss it with patients on a case-by-case -case basis, but you have to be careful in giving a blanket recommendation there. But it's worth a consultation with an oncologist that knows these data. Not all of them will, so it's always good to get a second opinion at one of the academic centers here in the city. We've got uh, my equivalent at Rush and Northwestern and UFC and where I am Loyola, we can always sit down and talk it through uh, if you need more information. Yes. Oh, you talked about the African-Americans yeah. having a high rate of uh, hormonal cancer. Um, and that might well, actually, that's not what I said. I said they have a high rate, high rate of genes that cause their tumors to proliferate more. Yes. It's not that they have more hormone positive. They actually have more hormone negative. But whether they're positive or negative, there's this biology that the, the genes that are <coughs> turned on tend to be those of proliferation more than in Caucasians. Yeah, and that might be dependent on socioeconomic uh, status or not? No, or actually... In our analysis, we got rid of that as an issue because these are all women who came in the door the same way, same institutions on these National Cancer Institute clinical trials, same doctors, same drugs. So the socioeconomic issue was removed, so to speak. Even though even so we had thought it was removed, we still adjusted for income level and educational level, and the findings were still true. Questions? Scott, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering how you went to Loyola. How I went to Loyola. Now, how did you choose oh. uh, that as a place of practice? Well, um, it's interesting. I was, you know, did my fellowship at University of Chicago. I was one of many fellows. And everybody had a niche there. I could have stayed there and been an instructor and tried to carve out a niche in a fiercely competitive environment. Loyola was building a program and needed someone to work in breast and lung cancer, which happened to be my areas. There were basically two or three faculty back then. So I took a chance and decided I wanted to be where I could uh, develop my program. My boss at the time was newly involved in one of these national groups. So for an assistant professor to get to chair a phase three trial so early in her career, was very unusual, but because of, you know, superintention of the Lord plus 
were, being there and being in the right place, I got to become involved in the national scene even before I had built up our local programs. So. Everybody's going to study or go to bed, one or the other. <laughs> yes? Oh, sorry. Can you make any comment on the use of tamoxifen versus the newer drugs in postmenopausal women? Yeah, so <clears throat> tamoxifen, as you know, is an anti-estrogen, so it hooks up with the receptor and it's kind of like a dirty gasoline and makes the cancer stop growing. The other class of drugs called aromatase inhibitors inhibit the aromatase enzyme, which in postmenopausal women is why you still make estrogen and don't look like a man. You still uh, create estrogen from your fatty stores. So this, that class of drugs is used only in postmenopausal women to shut down the fuel to the cell, whereas Tamoxifen works across all age groups. Now, in postmenopausal women, the aromatase inhibitors have a slight edge for disease-free survival in very large trials conducted worldwide. However, uh, there's no overall survival benefit to one over the other. Um, and there's a different toxicity profile, uh, very different. So some women can take one class but can't take the other. The differences in disease-free survival become more important when you're at higher risk for recurrence. Uh, whereas if it's lymph node negative disease, it may not make too much difference what you take. Although most, most of us feel you should at least have a year, two or three of the aromatase inhibitor as part of your treatment. But it's beyond five years now, it's 10 years of treatment, so it's a whole nother story. Um, I didn't develop it here because I wasn't part of that research, so, uh, but can talk about it with patients as needed. Everybody? Okay. Good? Yep. You're welcome. Would there be cases in which uh, you would encourage someone who... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't notice you had oh, I didn't have my hand up. Oh, yes. Earlier. But would there be instances in which um, you would encourage someone who gets a very discouraging diagnosis from most of the traditional doctors to come to you. What types of oh, special cases yeah. would you say go over so, the heads of your local practitioner? So one of the very time consuming things that I do is, you know, second, third, fourth opinion consultation. So patients who've been around the block and have tried the standard things and have seen good doctors but now want to know if there is more to offer. Um, sometimes I come up with ideas uh, to help. I think there's always hope to help some aspect of the patient's situation, even if it's late in the disease course. You can always perhaps improve their symptom control or other things. So yes, I, I generally require that the patient is not, so to speak, at the last gasp, uh, is able to be up and about uh, when they come to see me because our cancer treatments are way too toxic when the disease has taken over the body and the patient's bedridden. So at that stage, uh, good palliative hospice care is much, much better than anything I could do. 